Thank you for joining us for National Mental Health Awareness Week, October 4th through 10th, 2020. My name is Emily Howard, and I work on the events team at the Ann Arbor District Library. In the following video, five Michigan poets recite poems that speak to the complexity, pain, and beauty of living with mental illness. Each poet will present an artist statement and then read selected works that illuminate their own experiences living with mental illness in themselves and loved ones. Please join me in welcoming these five Michigan-based poets, Karen Holman, Daniela Tutsi Watson, Marlon Jenkins, Jennifer Metzger, and Ellen Stone. Sutures. Blessed is that outburst of rage, its scythe and rendered fat. Bless the heart closed tight as a fist around the last straw and the thin straw too. The heart, the day it surrenders, opening I bless. And dare mending its sting, that dare a needle, a shaft of light. And this is an earlier poem. It's called Living Daylights. I thought she left for good when my soul left my body and a random sound filled the vacuum. She watched me tremble in the deep sexual trill of betrayal, pinned by the small finger bones, thrashing on a clothesline. Shuddering there, I watched her flap her arms into flight as if she could escape on pure will the way I did in childhood dreams, until I caught her cowering near the ceiling of this room, breathing my burnt hair. And this is a poem about hanging on after um, Psalm 23. The twitch is my grip, I won't let go. I am with Cliff, one hand slips, the other grabs hold. Twitches my breath, left behind, running ahead. I wake, tear up, I wink, not at you, but with you. Fingernails, skin of my teeth, muscle of tongue, my trifecta, I am ridden by shudder. My heart hiccups again and again, out of boredom. I hold without thinking onto the plane of shade stenography, there we usher them who are not us and cast we who are not us in with all darkness your own, my shadow. Surely I will follow me and dwell in Kling's Valley between the sympathetic and parasympathetic forever and ever. And this is about dedicated to my husband whose love saved me. It's called Our North Forty. As if the horizon flowers, an umbrella psalm of air, ecumenical light flares in icicles, like poppies floating in a clear bowl. Delphinium, our cerulean house. A clean sheet is a billowing sail over the green where we lay in a tick of forgetting, pulled closed by night's drawstring. In that other world where we never meet, I think I probably drowned. And this one is called Joy. I woke warily to thin spring light in the tug and sachet, melisma, a variety of argument. It's rays clean as a slice green pear. A fleur de lis cuts this soil in March, then curls into May. Resilience, as if I were in violet, round like trout eye, like a coin, purchases a few minutes in a meter. 
oxygenating a sky and invents pristine blue respite. Dew, in turn, magnifies light while the light itself evaporates it. And this last poem is called What I Would Have Taught a Daughter. I won't tell you how you're alone, but how we touch a wishbone where we hold hands. Words network the synapses between us, first bridges and roads. We're all contagious. This, our heirloom. No one is anonymous, no secret ever kept. In isolation, there is music. In blindness, there is warmth. Loneliness, too, touches itself. Even the broken, beyond repair call to someone. I'm not sure why we shatter like it's our birthright, everything we touch, except the world has been flying apart since every particle went twirling into far deep fields of radiant poppies. Thank you for listening. I'm going to be reading poems from my first full-length book, uh, What is in the Blood, which was published by Mayapple Press uh, this past March. Um, and it's largely a book about my mom's uh, bipolar diagnosis when I was young and then taking care of her when I became a mother myself. My mother's mind. She doesn't remember how she lost it. We were young and needed her remembering the regular things, plates coming on and off the table, venison in the frying pan, glasses of milk poured from the dented pail, greasy stove, cluttered counter, whole days, weeks dissolved, her mind a dark cave, plummeted below the tufted quilt, dusty gray floorboards, deep into dirt cellar, the coal bin, glossy lumps chinking and clanking, old red furnace singing a burning song. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we wandered there, lit shards of kindling like small torches, held them, watching wood turn into space, tiny flickered chambers opening small rooms in the dark. Mm -hmm. Summer, 1972. One, the empty jar of morning, how it glows. Here they line up on the linen tea towel, my future under glass, its clear blue hue. If the day is a container, how does it fill? Sweet as raspberry or the bitterness of crab apple, that pucker whoosh of tongue, glump of blanched plums and peaches, packed snap of green bean, dill, vinegar. She stirs tomato sauce. We dart around her like moths on the summer bulb, barn cats that peek out behind the bales. Oh, summer of tomatoes and all that called to us that was green and bruised and crushed. Mm. Two, when you tell me mom is in bed, the words are sticky and cave in around me like the cracks on the asphalt road in late July. But I'm going to drown there, all molasses and sink mud. I feel it in my marrow, this losing grip on the morning. What bird trill moment I thought we were promised, the open door, haze above the cornfield rose. Hand me down. Worry, a kernel seed my mother's mother sewed in her breast pocket, kept there lightly, just over her heart. 
gray tweed jacket woven of cardinal feather, shredded sky, cinders, passed down, fitting sure as clouds fill gaps in blue, sleeves of doubt, collar shrugged, bleak weather, a sure prediction. You look just like your mother. The second half of the book is more um, the part of my life where I'm more caretaking of my mother. And this book is called Container of Souls. Mm. Hospital said slowly is a soft hiss spitting, air whispered, thin and forced from a filled container. We are falling into the darkened parking lot, waiting room, from a long distance, it seems, although it is just across town, over the empty train tracks and quiet river bridge. Time drips differently here, thick and solitary. We all need somewhere to go, and some of us come here. Teenage girl with deep scratches on her neck who reminds me of someone. Slight man with braids draped in white cotton, leg tapping a metronome. He could be the boy I taught in kindergarten who did not want to grow up. My mother scrunches her face up sour as June apples, saying something is not right, a blue cloud seeping into her brain, bows her head as in prayer, lacing her veiny hands. The river of my mother's life flows past us, slumped in these waiting room chairs. An east wind is coming up, she says. Cold, it will be cold when we get back outside. How fluorescent our faces, unreal in this vinyl ether world. Here we say, we have come here looking for a path. Give us back what we have lost in the sanitary chapel of the emergency room. Frost settles over the soccer field across the highway. I am aware that all the young leave, but then they must find their way. Here, my mother tells her story. And when I repeat it, she says she does not know if what I say comes from the heart. She needs the doctor from the ninth floor to sit with her, confirm her sadness like a priest confirms sin. Settling over the white building as the patients move toward cars or beds. River calling across the night asphalt, rooks and owls folding into trees. survival instructions. Mm. You would think it was the right amount of milligrams, the correct tincture, how the chemicals became compound and interacted with her blood, clear markers that indicated Tegretol or Zyprexa in the early days, lithium before it poisoned her. Now they'd say it might be grit, the easy way she made it through the years or not that it was easy just that she was strong enough to keep her wits together, fought to stay out of the hospital, along with ignoring voices that told her to walk 40 miles or move out of her place without a plan, not homeless. It was chalked up to some therapy, luck, eventual peace with taking meds prescribed, not killing herself, keeping her family, God willing. Mm. I'm going to read two poems. Um, the second one is a letter to Dr. Takuto Maraki, um, who is a character from the video game Persona 5 Royal. Um, the only thing you need to know about him is that he is a, um, a psychologist who's researching how trauma and tragedy um, impact our cognition of the world and is trying to find um, better ways to treat people when conventional methods aren't enough. Um, and he meets the, the main characters in the video game um, because he becomes a school counselor at the school that just experienced a traumatic event. But we'll get to that in a second. The first poem um, I wrote on the first warm day of February when it felt like spring. Um, and spring is my least favorite season and is uh, the worst season for my mental health. 
It's spring, I feel free, I want to die. I am the sad animal who misses the feel of barred steel on teeth, who fears the outside space between eye and horizon, every open field full of wildflowers. I am allergic to each blooming one, each new degree causing the atoms to move faster. In the cold, there are slower molecules, no sun to shine on the boy's neck as he shuts the door on the other boy's head, no sun to slip into the eyes of drivers on the freeway. I keep the windows closed to keep the ribosomes from rushing out the cell wall. In winter, I consider touching the naked trees and saying same, but in winter, I stay inside, away from how the sun is a gaslighting motherfucker. It's so loud I can't hear my ears ring. Same with the wind. Each open window, one less barrier between me and the man who and the men who, and those who would. The sun makes me want myself martyred. Knowing even holiness can kill is a kind of company, dangerous containment, a terrible, unterrible veil. Even God, having lived on the mountain, isolated himself for a time in a room. Letter to Dr. Takuto Maruki begins with a quote. I don't want a single one of you to think that an unfair reality you've been forced into is the only one that you have to live. Dr. Maruki, Persona 5 Royal. It must have been at least a full week since I had seen the sun, noticed the sky. Even the pizza delivery man arriving at midnight, I cannot look in the face. It was true what the study taught me. A cookie alone in a container tastes better than one from a container full, but also the sky was too much. It swallowed me into its vastness and spit me out back onto my couch. I have been both the one sitting next to someone I love in a hospital, their unkind mind strangling their speech, and the one whose depression thieves my memories, chains me to the dirty bed. Under that same sky, now bright with early summer, around the corner from the bookstore, 15 minutes from my home, an officer held his knee into a man's neck until he died. He couldn't breathe, and then he would never breathe again. Three officers and the son watched. My anxiety kept me from the protests where the riot-geared police flung tear gas canisters while protesters held their hands up, but even at home, I knew I was not safe. At the protest I did attend, my joints couldn't handle the weight of kneeling. We cannot build the breath back into George's lungs, but what reality can be created in place of the raised buildings? To live a life of one's own choosing, what one has built themselves is surely beautiful, but my hands are too tired to make. And besides, I have fewer and fewer materials with which to build. How many more of us will they watch taken on camera before our lungs can breathe sky, not burned with tear gas and smoke? How much more art can catalog our grief? I am tired of our beautiful suffering. I know it is not sin to ask for one's cup to be taken, and this world has already taken so much. I open the cookie container and find not what I hoped for, the cookies taken to make me savor the last one, but then even the last one had been stolen. Even the life I have chosen is not a life I have chosen. I want to look at the sky and see only the sky, not an empty openness I can't reach. Truth is, if removing the pain that led to the poems means I lose the poems, then burn every page. Wipe the whole hard drive.
This is from a longer prose poem called Release. My father photoshops the word waterfall over the waterfall in the photo. In case I didn't know, in case I had forgotten. I admire the word waterfall, a clothed thing. It clambers over rocks, turning natural tricks. If only I could forget about the mega church over the hill with air conditioned legs inside. If only I were thirsty or had a vestigial pail. It's like whale watching, waiting for my return or like waiting for the rain to put out fires in a mega drought. Palm fronds rattle their accordion hands as I open up my mega mouth to accept my share of ashes. The ball game crackles from a tiny television set and shoves the sky into a pocket. My father stares at the air as if there were a ball there. There's a gelatinous substance on the steeple. There's a gelatinous substance, I'm sure of it, though I've never been up there. Now I'll never know love again, and love will never know me, because the world is a scheme, and a scheme cannot lift a saggy, liver-spotted hand from a hymnal. The little light in the microwave oven comes on when I open the door, and it's such a relief to not think about how little things work, like the frozen things invented by men with degrees and taste who study the desires of the tongue and approximate, approximate how I heat them. Behind every curtain, behind every cupboard, a chasm yawns open to expose the underworld. We shouted verses in the common room until the doctor said, shut up or the moon will turn purple and the world will end. Is there an anecdote here that is worth its weight in salt? I throw a pinch over my shoulder for good luck getting out. At night, I want to be told stories about bunnies. Bunnies that go to school, wear clothes, fly planes, play instruments. Bunnies that hop to school each morning carrying clarinets in hard black cases. The bunnies try to play a song together, but they produce only squeals. They ask their music teacher, why is this so hard? There comes a pause as long as the fence that keeps the rabbits on one side of Australia. Certainly talking was hard at first too, the music teacher said, but you didn't stop talking. If I ever manage a mental health clinic, I will try to ensure that the waiting room signs don't have any double meanings. Have a seat. Your therapist will be out to get you soon. A fake philodendron gathers dust in a mauve vase, the mauve of the 80s, and a wall clock has ticked itself askew. White noise blows by unused. A seaside conversation driven by the difference between prolific and productive. A productive wind builds mountain after mountain. A prolific wind jangles wind chimes hanging from the eaves. My father drinks bourbon in the backyard while I circle. Ice cubes clink as they relax in the glass, but I cannot relax because nothing stays solid forever. A man in the hospital in a striped shirt and plaid pants could see UFOs all the time and right now, in fact. A woman said, girl, don't believe anyone wearing stripes and plaid. I'm waiting for the day when I've forgotten the fabric and the texture of all that, when there's nothing left to see but an old rotting barn that hasn't been used for hundreds of years. But I have no use for barns. The red barn in my head is not a real barn. I once saw a gray barn, the sooty rain-colored wood maybe was red once. No, I cannot lay claim to any barns. The bunnies study the surface of the moon and try to determine whose face it is. Their first and only guess is God's face. The moon is big enough for two of us, but how could I believe that God would ever dream of giving me so much room? Now the rosebuds are blooming on the fence out back, 
but it's like calculus trying to make an adage out of nothing. The sugar in the sugar bowl hardens into a rock to represent one idea of patience. It's like the blackbird that fills a parabola with pebbles to get the water out again. My father does crossword puzzles in his armchair so he can fall asleep inside a word. He doesn't worry that he won't wake up even after all the nights he watched me charge around the yard like a rabid thesaurus. I said anything in my head, and in my head was holy, 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 and Arkansas, and Blake Light tragedy. Did I tell you Ginsburg visited me? He stood beside me at the dinner table and said, first thought, best thought. But he was talking about death, not poetry. Was I dead? No, because the plates kept coming. Thank you. Hello, um, I'll be reading three poems. Uh, this first poem is called, This is Not a Donnie Darko Reference. This is not a Donnie Darko reference. I've never seen the movie, but my therapist told me about it when I told him about a date I was on. The room was dimly lit, an Italian place. We'd yet to order food. The man was nice enough. I didn't feel unsafe or anxious, but then a rabbit appeared sitting at the only empty table across from us. It wasn't there, and then it was. Not a real rabbit, but a person in a rabbit suit, white tattered fur. I could tell by the body that something was wrong. They were looking down, arms hanging at their sides. I figured that was about time to end the date. I told my date I needed to go home. It's my anxiety, I said, though I wasn't anxious, but I wanted to keep the rabbit out of it. I entered back into the summer evening, shaken. I called my mother and told her, but she gently reassured me that it was a sign, though she didn't say of what. What did the rabbit have to tell me? That I'm sad? I already know that. I'm a rabbit? Not so sure. Was it to get me out of the date? If so... Thank you, strange rabbit, for your guidance. You, who appears to me without notice, if you're here to tell me that I'm sick, please do so gently. Evening Song Here at my kitchen table, surrounded by last night's beer cans, this morning's coffee and breakfast plate with two blueberry, blueberries left that I've deemed inedible, I'm trying to pull from my mind's nebula, littered with my memories fragmented making of myself, floating around like the fruit flies that are found and drowned in the delight of my uncorked wine bottle, not unlike myself these days. A song to sing to you. Although in my sadness, I cannot think of any good song, so instead, let me tell you about this evening, the walk I took my dog on the puff of pollen that my pup clumsily pranced after like a fawn. Sorbet sky, I would lick you if I were tall enough, or if God made me dead. I would sink my hands into your orange. It would drip through my fingers just like a messy child eats ice cream. God has so many treats, his teeth are rotten. God is a messy child, spilled his glory over the earth. Against the sun, I would cast a shadow in my leaving. For a moment, I'm non-human. I have mastered something beautiful. I flung myself against the evening, but it gave me back, hung over with its song, humming in my mess, hanging over my kitchen table until the morning hours that mother me. My puppy licks my ankles to wake me or love me. I'm nothing remarkable, but I'm alive. And this last poem is called A Series of Small Miracles After Ross Gay, After Gwendolyn Brooks. 
This morning, I stepped outside and the chill kissed my forehead, but only after I gave permission. And afterwards, I was still okay with the touch. And when I returned to my apartment, I was okay with the leaving. But we aren't there yet. My neighbor walked by with their dog, stopped to let me pet her and thanked me for doing so. And listen, now I will tell you. Today, my room is warm. I sit on my bed. I lift my shorts. I notice the crease between my thigh and lower belly. Trace my finger between that small valley and I say, it is good. I notice my thigh, its generosity. Squeeze the fat of it, slap it, one time for good measure. Listen, in this poem, there are no men. I give to myself and give again. I cut my small breast and I'm thankful. There is no one here to tell her that she does not have enough to give. I play a record and my mind is clear to hear it. Today, I lie in bed all afternoon and it is my choice. I breathe in and the breathing is simple. I breathe out, a mango grove fills my room. I crawl into a cradle of branches. I rest my head on a bunch of mangoes. Yesterday, I heard someone call out sorrow and I did not turn my head. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.